what is quantitative reasoning? Um, quantitative reasoning, it can be described a lot of different ways, but I think breaking down those two words is probably the best thing. So quantitative, right? We think of quantify. Quantify meaning using numbers. So when you're talking about quantitative reasoning, you're talking about using numbers to describe things, um, whether it's just basic data or just numbers you pull out of your pocket. And reasoning is understanding and being able to communicate, um, you know, having a, an idea of what you're talking about. So we're in quantitative reasoning, we are using numbers to explain things. So you're kind of doing the what, where, why, and how. Those kind of questions you are answering with numbers. All right. So consider a local farm in which both horses and cats live. 24 horses and six cats live on the farm. Compare this. So quantitative reasoning is using numbers to discuss things. So looking at this, we know we have 24 horses to six cats, right? So we can compare them using ratios. Now, you may note it, right? Ratios can be written in different ways. And I think the easiest way, if you look at the last one, which we wrote as a fraction, you see a fraction, fractions can be reduced. So I'm going to go ahead and reduce this fraction to be 4 over 1. So when you think about this, you can think of 24 horses to 6 cats. That is totally okay. But you can also think of it as 4 horses for every 1 cat. So if you're on this farm and you see 1 cat, okay, there are 4 horses that comp uh, compare to that 1 cat in terms of number on the farm. So you can do more with that. You could also go cats uh, to horses. I just did everything horses to cats because that's the way it was written in the problem. In the next one, 40,000 vehicles were sold by a local city last year. That's a total number. And 30,000 of those were cars, 7,000 were trucks, and 3,000, I guess, were other. Okay, so make a few comparisons. Well, if we go part to whole, we can talk about in terms of percents. And you get more into this as the, the semester goes on. But I can say there are 30,000 cars to 40,000 total vehicles. And if I write that as a fraction, I think fractions are the easiest to work with just because um, it's easier to see that you can reduce. I mean, you can see that these zeros chop out and we're left with three-fourths. Three-fourths is 75%. That means 75% of all vehicles were cars. You can do that same thing with trucks, right? There were 7,000 trucks over 40,000 total cars. And that reduces to 7 over 40, which is 17.5%. So 17.5% of all vehicles were trucks. You could also compare similar to what we did in the last problem, and I'm out of space, but you could say like 7,000 to 30,000 trucks to cars, or 30,000 to 7,000 um, cars to trucks. You can do a lot of different comparisons when you have numbers. Now let's get into kind of thinking through some problems. Victor wants to eat dinner tonight at a local cafe. He wants a soda for $1.99, a beef sandwich with fries for $6.25, and two cookies, which cost 50 cents per cookie. This cafe is in Indiana, and Indiana has 7% sales tax. Would he be able to afford his meal if he's only got a $10 bill in his pocket? So let's start with that question. There's a lot of questions that go into this problem, but let's start with that first one. So we've got a soda, a sandwich and fries, two cookies. So the two cookies is $1, dollar, right? 50, uh, 50 cents a piece. His total meal is nine twenty four. But they tell us, we're in Indiana, you've got to pay 7% sales tax on that meal. So if you think about it, 924 times 7% sales tax, Victor is going to pay 65 cents in tax. So his meal plus tax is $9.89. Can he afford his meal? The answer is yes. Yes, he can. Well, he's at a diner, and generally at a diner you tip when you finish eating. So does he have money left over for her tip? Well, technically the answer to that is yes. He had a $10 bill. He spent $9.89 on his meal. His waitress 
is going to get an 11 cent tip. I don't know about you, but if I'm that waitress, I'm not too happy with that. So maybe he should have had, um, maybe he shouldn't have had cookies, and he could have left a little bit bigger tip, and that would have been a little bit nicer. I mean, if you think about it, generally we say 15% is a good tip. Um, 99 cents would be considered a 10% tip, and he's not even close to a 10% tip. So that is a bad tip in terms of that. All right, let's go to the next one. A study shows that 9 out of 10 people, on average, prefer dogs over cats. According to the study, would your new neighbors be more likely to own a dog or a cat? Well, dog. 9 out of 10. That's 90% of people. That is more than half. That's the majority. Because the majority prefer dogs, you can expect that if somebody moves in, they would prefer a dog. That doesn't mean everybody prefer dogs, right? We've got that 10% that don't, but it's a majority, and therefore we would expect the dogs, to, uh, dog lovers to be moving in next door. Hopefully you like dogs if they're moving in and bringing dogs. Number six, well, excuse me, that's page six on my thing, my bad. Uh, number three, when Alberto leaves his home for work, he drives constant rate 35 miles per hour. Adrian, same distance as Alberto, drives 50 feet per second. If they leave for work at the same time, can we figure out who gets to work first? If so, how? If not, why not? Well, just given the information you're given, the answer is no, you can't. But you can do some mathematical manipulation in order to do it. We have to be able to compare. And you can't compare 35 miles an hour to 50 feet per second. You can only compare items if they are in the same units. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the 50 feet per second, and I am going to, that's one second, and I'm going to go ahead and do this conversion to miles per hour. So, there are 5,280 feet in one mile. And you will get to um, dimensional analysis, which is what I'm doing right now in a few weeks. Um, so, don't fret. But this is kind of the mindset that you're in. You have to get it to be in the same. So, I'm going to change feet to miles, and I'm also going to change, there are 60 seconds in one minute so that makes my seconds go away and there are 60 minutes in one hour and that makes my minutes go away so you can see now in the top I have miles and in the bottom I have hours so I multiply the numbers that are in the numerator and then I divide by the number in the denominator and Adrian travels 34.09 miles per hour so if this is Adrian and now we're in the same units. Adrian tra travels 34. Alberto travels 35. Who's going to get there faster? Alberto. He is going just a little bit quicker than uh, our friend Adrian. Uh, on to number four. Samantha is 54 inches tall and Paul is 5 feet tall. How many, how many Samanthas and Pauls must be stacked on top of each other until their heights are equal? And what is that height? Now, there's a couple different ways you can do this. We'll start with Sam on this side and Paul on this side. We know Sam is 54 inches tall, while Paul is 5 feet. Hopefully, you know there are 12 inches in one foot. So if he's 5 feet, I would take 12 times 5, and Paul is 60 inches. So now I have um, them both in inches. And you can either uh, use, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, like a common, um, these common multiple, which is what I did. Um, what number do these both go into evenly? Or you can simply keep adding. If I take another 54, then I'm at 108. Another 54, I'm at 162. Whoa. And you can just keep going. This one's 120, 180. And you keep going until they get, uh, till they're the same. Now, depending on your numbers, that can take an awfully long time. Um, what it comes down to is that 540 inches, 54 goes into 540, 60 goes into 540, and so it's going to take 10 Sams and 9 Pauls, and that would be at 540 inches. Um, the way I did this, um, I knew that 60 had to end in a zero, right? Um, when you add a bunch of 60s together, your answer always ends in a zero. And so I knew whatever height was going to be the same had to be end in a zero. So when I looked at 54, well, what can I multiply by 54 to end in a zero? Well, either a 5 or a 10. 
So I multiplied 54 by 5 and got 270. Well, 60 doesn't go into 270, so that didn't work. But when I multiply by 10, I get 540, and 60 does go into 540. And so that's how I figured out my answer. Uh, but, of course, there's different ways to do it. And the last one. I last ate 40,000 seconds ago. Am I probably hungry right now? Explain your answer. Well, 40,000 seconds is a lot of seconds. And it's hard really, well, it's hard for me to kind of think of how long is that. Um, you know, I can think 120 seconds is two minutes, right? That I can handle, but 40,000 is a lot. So we're going to go back to that um, dimensional analysis that I mentioned earlier. And we're going to change seconds into stuff that I can deal with. So I know there are 60 seconds in one minute. So when I do this, my seconds go away and I'm in minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and divide 40,000 divided by 60, and that gives me 666.67 minutes. Well, that is still a pretty big number. So I'm going to go ahead and take my 666.67 minutes, and I'm going to change that to hours. I'm going to say there are 60 minutes in one hour. Right? So that right there makes my minutes go away. I divide my answer by 60, and I get 11.11 hours. Now that I can wrap my head around. So if you last ate 40,000 seconds ago, you last ate 11 hours ago. And I don't know about you, but that makes me hungry just thinking about it. So if you're given these big numbers that are hard to um, really play with, you can change them and manipulate them using dimensional analysis to put them in ways that we really are better at understanding. So that is your crash course on quantitative reasoning. Uh, what is it and playing with it?